coming up. I forgot to uh, announce a very important part of the evening. And that is, thank you all so much for participating. Thank you all so much for being here. And that includes the audience members. We greatly appreciate you. These pieces grew out of a writing exercise called a six liner. Um, a six liner means that you write a scene with two characters and each character has three lines. So what we decided to do was take that exercise one step further. There were five playwrights in the group when we did this exercise. So we decided to eat, have each playwright start a script and then we passed it around between the five of us, each script, so that everyone wrote six lines of the script and we wound up with five scripts of 30 lines each. So um, that's how these scripts were born. And going up is uh, the script that I originated so Mendor is also going to mention the person who originated the script. And that means uh, that they came up with the idea for the setting and the characters. So this is going up. An elevator sits on stage. The front of the elevator is facing upstage toward the back wall, the wall that the audience is facing. The back of the elevator is open and, the, and is the closer side to the audience. At the moment, the doors to the elevator are closed. The elevator is the only thing lit on stage. It is all that we can see. The elevator measures about six feet square. It has floor buttons on only one side. The audience is right. Since the back is open, we can see the buttons. The panel with directions for emergencies, rules, Perhaps we can also make out an escape hatch on the top of the elevator. At rise, the elevator doors open. Enter Towns, an any age female dressed very casually in hiking gear. She carries a backpack, wears a hat, has a pair of binoculars hanging around her neck. She steps into the corner furthest from the floor buttons and pulls from her packet pocket a pack of long brown more cigarettes. She places one in her mouth. Enter Benjamin, an any age female or an any age male, also dressed casually and perhaps a little on the gay side. He is carrying a tote from a health food store. Dean, can they unmute, please? Are they muted? It's still. No, muted. I believe you're okay. muted. Okay, we're here. we're back. All right. So, uh, to your first line, please. Okay, let's see. Just a minute. What floor? Are you going to like that? Forty-eight, please. He pushes the button for her, starts to push his own, then thinks better of it. Well. She removes a small lighter from her pocket and looks at it thoughtfully. They stare each other down for a moment. She lights a cigarette. I can't believe you did that. What's the big deal, man? It's only a cigarette. Yeah, but, but there are rules. Look, there's some right here. I'm sure it says something about... Oh, oh, well, it's horrible for you anyway, especially though. You forgot to push your button. Here, I'll push the damn button for you. That would be floor number 47. 
We have a winner, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Benjamin Warren of Unit 4721. I'm sorry, I don't think we've met, so how do you? Oh, I know a lot more about you than you could possibly think, Benji Ben Benjamin. What do you think these binoculars are for? <laughs> Bird watching? Keeping my titties warm? Uh, if you were implying that you have been eavesdropping on me, you ought to know that there are rules. No, there are laws against that sort of thing. Uh, and I uh, intend to. Uh, oh, really, Benny? You crack me up. You really do. <laughs> Go ahead. Refer me to whatever or whoever you intend. Throw in smoking, too. <laughs> and I'll just show them, well, well, some really, really juicy photos. You know, Benzene, there are rules against stuff that you do when at 47, uh, 21, naughty boy. Benjamin stares, looking as if he has been hit with an axe. Uh, have you noticed something? The elevator hasn't moved. Maybe we should. Uh, oh, dear, dear Benji, you have been so obsessed with rules, you didn't even notice. The elevator has moved. And then it stopped. We're stuck exactly between floors 20 and 21, almost halfway to our destination. So press the alarm button and let me enjoy my smoke while I sit down. Uh, hello? Hello, anybody there? The elevator is stuck. Hello? Relax, Benji. Of course, sooner or later, someone will notice. Come, sit down with me and tell me about you. What do you do for a living? None of your damn business. And I'm not sitting down. Yeah, um... So now you're coming to your senses, good boy, Benji. Now tell me about you. Well, I like photography, see? We have something in common. Is your camera in your backpack? Whoa, 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 back up, Benjamin, back up. <laughs> Benjamin oh. grabs her forcefully by the throat with one hand, nearly paralyzing her. She chokes. With his other hand, he reaches into her backpack and pulls various <laughs> items out, including her camera. <laughs> ah, I'll take this. <laughs> Ta Towns uh, 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 manages to break uh, free of his hold. She kicks him, and in the scuffle, a pistol falls out of her bag. She picks up the gun and points it at him. Uh, 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 uh. All right, now, do I scream for help or do you? Okay, okay, calm down. You're shaking. So are you? Are you nervous? You want a cigarette? No, I don't smoke, and there are rules. Indistinct clunking and hammering sounds become gradually louder as would-be rescuers attempt to unstick the elevator and rescue its passengers. In the IDF, there was only one. Survive. The IDF? What the fuck? Are you Jewish? I was born Rivka Lefkowitz. What do you care? I'm Jewish too. Didn't you see the menorah on my sideboard down there? You better clean your binoculars, Rivka. You little shit. You're a disgrace to the Jews. I ought to plug you, but... There, there are rules. rules! The roof hatch opens and a ladder descends. Curtain. <laughs> woo Oh, that was perfect. Applause. Oh, really great. I was laughing hey. out loud. Very nice. Perfect. Marta, Marta, you're a, you're a new Yay. Player. You're a gem. Okay. Uh, the next one up is called The Wedding Day. Mendor, you can take that away and introduce us. Thing number two 
It's the wedding day, originated by Alice Fund. The stars are Nancy, who's uh, Lynn Ebner, Deb, Jean Adams, stage director, Rick Bocha. The wedding day. The scene is a mid-sized bedroom, a bed, nightstand, lamp, etc., and an upholstered chair. The most prominent item is a wedding dress, hanging ready to be worn and matching shoes. The characters are Nancy, a young woman about to get married, and Deb, her middle-aged, self-confident mother. Nancy is just out of the shower. She paces the floor barefoot and wears a light robe. She's clearly nervous. In comes her mother, Deb, in good spirits, all dressed up. I just tried the champagne and it is absolutely delicious. Are you ready to get dressed, dear? It's about time. You're lucky the weather is so good. You will feel neither warm nor cold, just perfect. And how about those shoes? We got them this morning while you took your beauty sleep. I hope they fit as you don't have any others matching the dress. Nancy jumps onto the bed and wiggles her free toes. They are too tight, but it doesn't matter. Don't worry, Mom, because I'm not going to wear them. And also, don't worry about the dress as I won't wear it either. I'm not getting married. It was a big mistake. I realized it was a big mistake that I would have to live with for the rest of my life. My mind is made up. I'm sorry. It's normal, my dear, to have last minute jitters. It happens to everybody. Maybe George is having similar thoughts right now. <laughs> Oh, come on, take a breath and let's get you dressed. It's a big day for all of us. Think of the tens of thousands of dollars your dad and I have spent on you, our only child. Of, of the guests already arriving and all those fine presents you're getting. Oh, come on, be positive. Nothing is perfect. You had three years to think about it. Today is just too late. I don't like George's kisses. <laughs> the sole idea of having to tolerate such kisses for the rest of my life depresses me. Oh, is that all? But it won't be for the rest of your life, dear. As soon as it becomes routine, he will lose interest. And after a while, the kissing will end. In the meantime, you just close your eyes and think of something nice, like ice cream or something you want to buy. George is a good man. I'm sure you must like something about him. Look at me and your dad. How many times have you seen him kissing me? Yes, of course. He, looked, he kisses me gently. I'm sure that's not the kind of kissing you mean. <laughs> And he does it always in front of people. I think he wants everybody to think that he loves me to compensate, to compensate for when he does or says something unkind. Mom, you are talking about you. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about me. Besides, don't forget the tight shoes. I'm not wearing them. I'm not getting married and that's that. <sighs> Sorry, Mom, for the inconvenience. Oh, my God. Mom? I refuse to argue with the stubbornest woman known to men. If you don't want to marry George, fine. I think that's a grand idea. He's a little on the heavy side, and he does kind of paw you. I've seen him. It is not appealing. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't like his parents one bit. But of course, that is neither here nor over there. Ugh, and I 
still remember that time he came over for the Thanksgiving dinner and he laid down on the formal living room sofa. Oh, my word. He must have been raised on a barn. There is only one catch, my dear. You will have to do all of the explaining. You will have to talk to your father, who, as I mentioned, spent quite this sack of coins to have this wedding for you, his little flower. You will have to explain to our guests twice, once before the ceremony, that is not, and again before the reception. Hmm. Maybe we'll eat anyway. And of course, you will have to explain to poor, put upon Georgie. I will have That's not, not fair. Ah, uh, what is not to be fair? Of course it is fair. You are the one backing out. You should do the explaining. I will wait here and sip this delicious champagne while you throw something on and greet I your... can't do that. I'll fall to pieces. It's just too embarrassing. <laughs> Guys, fall to pieces. That is not the <laughs> least bit funny. Oh, but my poor little duckling, that is what Georgie will be singing. I'm not doing this. You can't talk me into it. Which of the ones? The Marion or the Splainen? <sighs> Mommy, you know that part about the kissing? How you said it goes away after a while? Mm -hmm. And you asked me about how many times have I ever seen kissing you? Mm. I mean, really kissing you? Mm. Yes, dear. Of course, I remember. And I hope you're asking because you're starting to see the light here. Family is always, you know, kissing sometimes. A bad kisser is not the end of the world, even though a good kisser is a delight. Just marry him and get on with it. Well, yes, Mommy. Something like seeing the light sort of not exactly but i do remember seeing something well see i've never really said anything about this but you know there was a time when i saw you and uncle charlie kissing and i mean kissing kissing i was up on the landing and you were down in the foyer it was when daddy was away in california you and Uncle Charles had just come back from lunch. He must have been one hell of a good kisser. Gosh, I think there must have been a mile of tongue involved. Oh. And possibly some panties and a bra on the living room carpet. Oh, Mommy, don't worry. I've never said a word to anybody. Nothing at all. Not one word about that little friendly family fumbling. Mm. But since now we're going to be all honest about everything, what choice do I have? Anyway, I don't think Daddy would mind. You're kissing his little brother. What? You? What? You? You? You little bitch! How dare you? Will you sink that low to make up a story like that? It never happened. Never. No, I and then when I do the explaining, the part about how that little episode so traumatized innocent little 11 year old me into skepticism about marriage. Why, you and Uncle Charles can do the, what was the quite way you said it? The splaining. Yes, that's it. You can do the splaining about how I made it all up. That ought to put some bubbles in the champagne. How could you? How could you do this to your own mother? Oh, and what do you think this will do to your father and to our standing? And I society? couldn't give a rat's potato about your standing. 
All I want is wait, to wait, hold on, hold. I said, hold on, God damn it. Rats, potato. What? What's happening? Can she just stop like that in the middle of a run through? <sighs> That's not the line. Rats, potato is not the line. The line is rats, patootie. <sighs> not potato, my dear. Potato is funnier. I don't even know what patootie means. And anyway, I don't think you can just stop like that in the middle of the scene. I can stop whenever I want to, Angel, and especially when you purposely change the fucking line for no good reason. You're not the writer. You're an actor. Say the line as written. <sighs> what an idiot. Melvin! Deb turns to the audience. I have had enough of this bullshit. Either she goes or I do. Fix this goddamn costume and bring this champagne to my dressing room. She exits. Nancy stares into the abyss, tears forming as the curtain falls. Wonderful. Bravo, bravo. You too. Oh, nice. Well done. Yay. That was terrific. Bravo. Bravo, bravo. Bravo. Okay, so um, do we want to keep going or do we want to stop and talk about the first two? I, I was confused. I'd like to talk about two. You started off in a, at a wedding, but then, uh, or uh, before the wedding, but then you went into acting into a, a play scene. Right. So I was confused. Um, let's everybody turn your camera on and we'll talk about the elevator scene that Marta and Bill did and the wedding scene that Lynn and I just did. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. <laughs> so um I, I started the going up scene writing it because I wanted the playwrights to have an opportunity to have to write something that was in a very small concealed uh, confined rather space where they wouldn't have the opportunity to go wandering out, you know, into the abyss. <laughs> they would have to be confined to something that was small and something that was definitely stageable. And uh, so that's why I uh, decided to stage uh, the piece that I started in an elevator. And uh, my first six lines were relatively harmless, other than the lady was going to uh, light a cigarette in an elevator. So then um, somebody took over after me. Anybody remember who that was? Whoever that was. Whoever that was. Let me see if I look at the script, if I can remember. <laughs> oh, the part about the hidden camera, I think that was me. Uh, about how she was photographing Benji. I think I introduced you. I was Maybe not. You. I don't remember. I think you introduced the um, spying on her, spying yeah. on Benji. So, well, there are rules. You forgot to push your button. <laughs> Yeah, it starts with towns. Here, I'll push the damn button for you. That would be number uh, 4721, Mr. Benjamin Warren. I think that was you, Tom. And I don't think we've met, so how do you know? And it comes to light that Towns has been spying on him. So we all took turns. I think you've got that concept by now. 
Um, so anybody have any questions about that process or any comments they'd like to make about that particular piece? I thought the acting was superb. Yes. And the directing and the cinematography. Good grief. <laughs> and the blocking and the doing it over in the corner and putting the stuff up. Academy Award wow. right that there. Was that was fun. <laughs> the star is born. <laughs> yes, Martha. Absolutely. We'll have to get you guys into act out. That was yep. great. Uh, now, uh, I just want to make sure is that a. Uh, is that a prop gun and, and was it properly? <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's the gun? <laughs> or was it a prop cigarette? <laughs> it, was a, it was a sausage. <laughs> Here, uh, shoot the gun. Go ahead. Fire the gun. Not at me. <laughs> oh, he, he put a, oh, he put a, uh, Oh, oh, sorry. Watch out. I didn't think you. I didn't think you loaded it. This is how <laughs> accidents happen. You know? Yeah. Anyway, this this morning, this morning we had a meeting at our church, and someone brought this for snacks, and that's how <gasps> we found the cigarette. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that's great. There it is. Is it beef jerky or something? <laughs> that's funny. We were perfect timing. Pulling, pulling the props together for the last couple of days. <laughs> good deal, good deal. That was brilliant. That was fun. That was fun. Marta, okay. I'm just shocked. I'm just shocked at how good you are. I, I, I mean, all the all the stuff that we've been working on all the last couple of years, you seem to have taken to um, automatically. Oh, I, I read the children a lot of books and dramatized them. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, let's uh, move ahead to the wedding day. And um, that one was originated by Alicia Fund. She is funny, in funny. Venezuela now, or she would be with us today. And uh, she probably is not going to continue to participate in the playwriting oh. group, but she really enjoyed her time with us. So uh, she's a great playwright. She's a great playwright and wow. um, yeah. I'm sorry that she's not gonna continue. We'll have to try to talk her into it. So she came up with the wedding idea and uh, hers was also in a confined space. It's actually set in a bedroom, but we didn't have that option available. <laughs> so, uh, and um, she came up with a, you know, a good plot. I don't wanna get married. And uh, and the mile of tongue was. I was fine. second <laughs> in that script, and I kind of took over the mother character and made her kind of a crazy uh, lady that gets her expressions confused and is sort of larger than life. Who did the last lines when it was revealed that it was really a play? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was good. That was very good. That was <laughs> Rick is guilty as charged. <laughs> Just ask him. <laughs> it was a bit of a cop out because I didn't know where to take the drama of it. The drama was was wonderful, the whole idea. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, what am I gonna do with this? Yeah, These... it was great. <laughs> And then, you know, what, what's going to happen? I have no idea what's going to happen at the wedding. And so, therefore, I'm going to bail completely and start a whole new play. As <laughs> a good twist, it was. Yeah, it, it was really a good was twist. good. <laughs> yeah, it was a good twist. Does that explain it, Vendor? Yes, it does. And I have a question. Who's, nobody answered the question about whose line was a mile of tongue. Uh oh. <laughs> That's Who's going to own up to that? Yes. <laughs> the whole idea of the mom uh, possi possibly having had an affair was uh, Tom's idea. Um. Tom likes to go straight to the gutter. 
<laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> the view is only up from there. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Any more uh, comments about that one or? I would like to say the shift was the shift to the drop to the fact that it was a a a play in the in the play that was shocking to me. It, it yes, was so that's, subtly. Uh -huh, yes, it, was it subtle. took me a, took me a couple of lines, a, a couple of lines to to understand. Oh, oh this I, is what's I didn't happening. Understand it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, when we we rehearsed it last night, and I'm like, what's this all about, Dean? I don't get this. <laughs> What's happening? I should but explain I thought, that um, we, were, we were reading um, in uh, Act Out at the time, we were reading Noises Off. Yes. And, yes. you know, there's a lot of jumping um, in and out of yeah. the play within the play in Noises Off. So I think Rick was partially influenced by that script and uh, where they're constantly jumping back and forth between the script of the play within the play and the script of the actor is speaking to one another. Uh -huh. Yeah. I thought the business of your taking off the wig and doing, it really made that work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Realize, yeah. Oh, this is not yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. That timing was great. Great. Was I great. added a line. He faced I hope, about. Uh, I hope Rick didn't mind. You guys made it work, man. I, I was, you guys made it work. I was kind of embarrassed when I submitted it, but uh, you guys pulled it off. Way to go. I, I added the line about the costume because I was having a little <laughs> costume malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> the wig was great too, Jean. The, uh, yeah. the, yes. the of your natural hairstyle. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. was, yeah. Was very good. Yeah, that was too cool. Very theatrical. Well, mm -hmm. I thought it was a little more Latino looking. Nothing I can do about my face, but I thought I could change my hair a little. <laughs> okay, so shall we move on to number three, or are we? Um... Everyone ready? Everybody okay. ready? Jen, are you in place? All yeah. right. Player, play number three, Loaded, originated by Rick Fauci, Gina Santoriso is played by Rick. Stephanie is played by Jane Gorbati and stage direction by Jean Adams. Okay, we just need to get a couple of uh, cameras off. Mendor, we need your camera off. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're good. Do we have uh, Jane? Is Jane going to join us visually? Jane or just is, uh, on the phone, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Got it. <clears throat> and this is loaded. Gino Santriso and his granddaughter Stephanie sit in the living room of Gino's large and beautiful house. They are in armchairs facing one another. Gino, at age 87, is sitting back comfortably. Stephanie is leaning in on the edge of her chair. She is staring at him piercingly. A driver. Hmm, you were just a driver? This house in New Jersey, a 15 acre ranch in Virginia, and a condo in Florida, trust funds for your grandkids, and you were just a driver? What did you drive, diamonds, body parts? Stephanie, darling, I'm your grandfather. We've been through this. I don't know what you keep asking. Bananas. I was a driver for a produce firm. That's what I did. I invested my salary. That's how I got rich. You invested. Some bananas. Back when a truck driver made $100 a week, if he was lucky. What did you invest in? Computer technology? In 1947? There was a no computers in 1947, and nobody was thinking of making any. You drove for the Corriadano Fruit Company? 
one of the shadow companies of the Montefiore crime family? It was not. Montefiore didn't trust me. What, with a name like Gino Santoriso, he didn't trust you? What? He didn't think you were Italian enough? I was young and trustworthy. My English wasn't good and I talked little. But I was a good driver. Because of that, the Montefiori's tolerated me. And Mr. Giordano trusted me. He raised my pay when I started delivering very little packages apart from the fruit. He paid me well, $100 per package. Then I started investing. <laughs> you see, you were a drug runner. I don't think so. Nobody talked about drugs. I heard the word heroin, and I knew what that meant, because it's the same in Italian. Eroina, the important woman in a play. I knew Mr. Giordano liked the theater, and I saw a connection there. That's when I started investing. For how long did you keep delivering the little packages? Not long. After a while, there were large, heavy bags in the truck placed under the bananas. I suppose not to squash them. And my pay improved even more. I never asked what was in the bags. Now I wonder, do you think they were stage props for the theater? <laughs> Grandpa, you're either too naive or too shrewd. I've heard enough of your driving career. Only one more question. Hey, stare attento. Be careful, mi bambina. Trascaltri, una mina da fare non si fanno troppe domande. Among sharp businessmen, one doesn't ask too many questions. Oh, gramps. Oh, mio nano caro. I hate it when you roll out that Italian stuff on me. Especially when you're just trying to scare me off. I'm your granddaughter, not the FBI. <laughs> Even if I were, I don't think the FBI is interested in too many fruit truck drivers. Gino stares at her for several long beats. Something has clearly changed in his demeanor. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm giving you good advice about living, living a long and healthy life, enjoying the fruits of a hard-working family. Okay, okay, I got that part. So, so whatever happened to that cute guy, Eddie Strollo? I liked it when he came around. He was always joking and laughing. Eddie who? Never heard of him. You must have that name mixed up with someone else. I never noticed your little boyfriends. What the actual... Grandpa, let me remind you the facts of Eddie Strollo. Stephanie, stop. I'm a demanding. I'm a commanding you to he stop. He was sharp, wasn't he, Eddie? He was sharp, smart, strong. And he had connections too, right? Was he a driver? He was here every Sunday night for three years, and then nothing. He and I were close, closer than anyone I could have expected among your associates. But suddenly he was gone, and he, he left no forwarding address. Maybe the dark and rancid East River? Is that forwarding, Eddie's forwarding address? Grandpa? No, no? Yes, he was a sharp. Too sharp for anybody, especially the Montefiori's. I could see. A grandfather can see. Did you want that cute guy to take you away and turn you into a gangster's mall? Or worse, the wife of a gangster? <gasps> oh, you had him killed, didn't you? You were jealous of him. Jealousy he'd take away your precious little bambina. But I wasn't a baby. I was 27 years old. And I loved Eddie Strollo. No, 
No, no, no, no, no, enough of this. You don't argue with me about this, about anything. Jesus, argue. I might as well argue with that brick wall behind the pool house. You know, the one with a not quite faded blood stain way down in the right corner. The right corner. She breaks down. The corner? Eddie? Eddie, oh, Eddie, oh, no, no. She continues to wail in uncontrolled emotional anguish, crying and falling to her knees at Gino's lap. Gino shifts uncomfortably, evidently struggling with his feelings. Maybe... You'll feel better if I tell you the worst part. Eddie didn't love you back. We all knew he was two-timing you with Giordano's niece, Teresa. I asked Gio to get him the hell out of here, and he did. The guys hooked him up with the Stracciatelli brothers in Boston. I hear he did okay up there in the gelato business. Under a new name, of course. Oh. Are you are you on the level? So help me God. <gasps> that rat. That moldy mozzarella stick. That stale slice of leftover pizza. I hate him. Cheva al diavolo. Sudden emotional key change. But, but what about that blood stain? Oh, that? That was some other guy. <laughs> I love you, Gramps. Let's go get a gelato. Curtain. <laughs> Nicely done, Jane. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, Mendor, you are nice. Jane, you also said it fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well done. Well done. Every, both of you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, well, Rick, Rick helped me. <laughs> the next oh. play is Partners, originated by Tom Diaz. Character is Holly Lofton, played by Barbara Morell. Forest Beach, played by David Macklin. Stage direction, Jean Adams. Okay, do we have Barbara? There you are. Okay, partners. Holly Lofton is a woman just on the north side of 40. While few would call her strikingly beautiful, she is very attractive, exuding the sort of smoky sensuousness that some mature women and a few men naturally grow into. She is apparently happily married and is all business in the office, however. Forrest Beach is a man of the same age as Holly. He, in contrast to Holly, is tending toward the hapless look of a portly graying uncle. <laughs> Holly and Forrest are partners in the Lofton Blackwell Investment Trust. Although they joined the firm at the same time, Holly's career has always been miles ahead of Forrest's. She is a senior partner while he has only just been made a junior partner. The two have adjusted to an amicable routine of service camaraderie in the office, but Forrest occasionally lets show a flickering glimpse of an edge of envy and a vague sense of having been wronged. The set. 
the glass walled offices of Lofton Blackwell Investment Trust in downtown Washington, DC. Holly has the corner office, rear stage left. It is half again the size of Forrest's office, center rear. To the right rear is a doorway into a small office kitchenette. Along the right wall is the double oak entry door into the office from a common hallway. The scene. It is early morning and the offices are dark. The light of dawn shows through the floor to ceiling glass windows in the offices of Holly and Forest. The light gradually becomes full as the scene progresses. The office door opens and Forrest enters. For the next several minutes, Forrest putters silently through his morning routine. He turns on the overhead lights in the common area, goes into his office, turns on the lights in that office, sets his laptop case on the desk, hangs his top coat and suit jacket. He then comes out and goes into the kitchenette where he is briefly out of sight. Holly then enters and goes directly to her office. She turns on the lights, hangs up her coat, and walks toward the kitchenette. Forrest comes out of the kitchenette when Holly is about halfway across the room. He is holding two large mugs of coffee. Hey, Holly. I heard you come in, so I made you your coffee. I made it the way you like it. He hands one of the mugs to Holly. You know, I think I saw you in last Saturday night. In Richmond? You were in Richmond? Richmond? Hell no. I was in Bethesda. Not by choice, believe me. I was in the office catching up on a few things, and who should pop in but Robbie Gilliam. I know you usually handle him, and I tried to call you, but your phone went right to, right to voicemail, which was full. You may want to clear it out. Anyway, I don't know if all the millionaires in Duluth think Bethesda is the pinnacle of Washington nightlife, but Robbie does. He insisted on treating me at the steakhouse up there. After dinner, I had to make an illegal U-turn to head back downtown. You know, the streets up there are so damn confusing. Anyway, the turn brought me right by the Hilton, and I could swear that I saw you waiting at the valet station for your car. Of course, it was raining, so I didn't get that great a look. Maybe you have a twin sister. My sister is three years older than I, and so far as I know, she is in New Orleans. And no, I wasn't in Bethesda. I was in Richmond the entire weekend. The home called me late Friday about my mother. She was having another one of her episodes. So I had to drive down there to calm her down and settle her back into her routine. But I think I might be able to explain your confusion. Really? How? You probably had your nose so far up Robbie Gilliam's ass that you clouded the lenses of your glasses. Several beats pass. The two look at each other without expression. Then Holly smiles and Forrest mm -hmm. chuckles and we put it on full screen. <laughs> you're cute when you're nasty. But I saw what I saw. Yeah. Does your sister look as gorgeous no. as you? Maybe she wasn't in New Orleans after all. Forrest, sweetie. Okay. Drop this. We gorgeous women are far from uncommon in the glamorous precincts of Bethesda. Mm -hmm. She was probably someone almost in my league. And anyway, can I trust you for once? Renee is in hospice. Tell that to anyone and I'll have your balls for earrings. Oh. Well, that detail is humanizing, kind of. So I won't ask about the blue mink. In fact, okay, okay, let's forget it like you say, and I'll go back to being the office drone. Mm. Although, it bore a striking resemblance to the mink that disappeared out of Fred's office last time. Uh, just saying, you know. Imagine that. A lady who looks kind of like me in a coat that might have been mink or faux mink or chinchilla, 
or dyed ocelot or I don't know, gabardine? You <laughs> are a chihuahua barking up a sequoia. <laughs> the work drone. Oh, he turns and walks two steps back toward her office. <laughs> You know, Robbie said the most interesting thing when I was trying to get you on the phone Saturday night. He said, are you sure you have the right number? Holly turns back to him. I said, sure, her cell phone. Which cell phone, he says, one, two, or three? Well, I thought about it. It's no shock that you have a second number here that no one in the firm knows about, don't we all? But a third secret number? That's a bit much, especially if Robbie knows about it. So I said, yes, I tried reaching Holling on both her numbers. I lied, I didn't know your second cell phone number, why would I? And Robbie says, well, try this one, cell phone number three. I called this weird 212 phone number and some weird answering service answers and says, weirdly, that you're not available, but if this is about the furs or the jewels or the package from Jakarta Shipping Limited that James has taken over the case, like I know what the case is. Richmond, huh? Someone who looks like you, huh? Sister in New Orleans, huh? Forest. One of the few things I like about you is your stupidity. It makes you so malleable. Another thing I like is that you make it so easy for one to see right through your unrelenting self-interest. Why in the world, in this piece of shit world, would Robbie Gilliam, piece of shit inhabitant of this piece of shit world, know my secret numbers or anything about me outside of this office firm. And if I had a secret number, why would it be connected to something as traceable as an answering service? As if answering services didn't become obsolete last century. You sad sack dummy. You child. All right, all right. I can't argue with none of that. Thanks for being frank. But James called me back. He said, it's not your sister's impending demise your family just bought a cemetery tomb for. One of those spooky tombs and one of those haunted but picturesque New Orleans graveyard. It's for a three and a half million dollars worth of precious stolen items from the far corners of this piece of shit world, as you call it. Plus, a hundred or so kilos of some of Indonesia's most desired poppy products, AKA pure, unadulterated, China white heroin. Um, yeah. And all Well, well, that's quite a bit of background. And all before our secretaries even punch in for the day. Did this James say anything else I should know before I report you to the firm's ethics officer? Ha, what have I done? Oh, you'd be surprised what I can dig up. With what evidence? I'm perfectly innocent. You, on the other hand. I what? I have lots of evidence on you. My good friend James has clued me in to the operation. I have the secret phone number I can happily turn over to the cops and, oh, there are those photos I took of you in that stunning blue mink. Holly is speechless. You might persuade me to make a deal. Deal? You brainless bastard. A deal with the devil? And scene one, scene two.
The set is the same as in act one. The scene early morning, Forrest and Holly have just arrived. Forrest, a few minutes ahead of Holly. Hey, Holly, I heard you come in, so I made your coffee just the way you like it. He hands one of the mugs to Holly. Were you in Richmond this weekend? Richmond, I wish. It was my weekend with the kids. Johnny had a fever, so we did not leave home. Susie baked cookies and asked me to give these to you. She asked me to give these to Uncle Forrest. I swear, she likes you more than her real uncles. Uh, she's sweet. You know, I had a dream last night. Weird. Weird and spooky, but I can't remember how it ended. It was about the two of us and... Tell me about your dreams some other time. Now, let's get to work. Remember, we have to make a presentation this afternoon about this case. Hands him a folder. Please make sure we have all the background information in chronological order. Forrest takes the file and walks slowly to the door as if talking to himself. I can't remember how the dream ended. He sees a blue mink jacket hanging from the coat rack. Stunned, he keeps walking. Thank you, Forrest. You're a good man and a good partner. Curtain. Okay. Yay. Bravo, bravo. Very, nice. very good. Very good. Very yeah. intriguing. Very mm. intriguing. Okay, so um, if everybody wants to turn their microphone and their cameras on, we can talk about uh, the two uh, loaded and partners, the uh, grandfather smuggler and the um, one we just saw. <clears throat> Any comments or uh, questions? Well, it's obvious here in the playwrights group that we're all trying to access our inner criminal. Uh, <laughs> That's too true, too true. <laughs> and or you can um, turn your camera on. Let me look in the chat because I've been getting um, comments in here that I haven't been acknowledging. Barbara, you are natural also. You can ask. <laughs> He's great. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. We in have many very world. talented people in ACT OUT. Um, Say that again, Jean. I said we have many very talented people in ACT OUT. That's right. And David, we need to, uh, we need to recruit you. You really, uh, that was a good mm -hmm. audition. You're in yes. if you be in. <laughs> and Marta, you know, Gary thought he was the last possible candidate for ACT OUT, and, he, and he's been shining along with everybody else. So, okay, so we have I'm a lose, I can't read. Too. Can I can I comment? Can I comment? I I do remember when uh, when Gary was new to the play group uh, play reading, and he said, "Well, at least I can sight read." Remember Gary? Yeah, it's oh, yeah. tough to read without looking at it. Well, that's <laughs> <tough>. <laughs> I I have to say, as a very appreciative audience member that I've been so impressed by the, um, the writing and the acting, and this is just a very enjoyable evening, and I wanna thank all of you. Oh, excellent. Is that Sandra Anne. or Anne? Anne. Can that you turn your camera on and we can see your shining face? Bill, could oh, you oh, do oh, me sorry, a favor? Sorry, here I am. <laughs> there oh, there you are. Bill, could you do me a favor? Certainly. Uh, pronounce uh, the bar. In oh, um, it's uh, Shakutami. Shakutami. Okay. Shakutami. Shakutami. All right. Okay. Uh, well, you know, uh, all of the writers in the playwrights group are are writers, and 
and we all write our our own stuff. What was so fun and exciting about this project is that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we passed the baton back and forth. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, that added an extra element of, of fun to it. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, it's amazing and listening to it, they're seamless. I can't they tell are. where that baton yeah, right. was. I really can't. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah exactly. I think we need to come up with a nom de plume and, and publish these under one name, you know? Like, <laughs> right. how, do, how does Tennessee Williams sound? Or, yes. <laughs> Rick wants to write a full length play where we each write 30 pages. Wow. In the same sort of rotating pattern. That's right. Right. I, I loved it and I loved how you played off each other's creative yeah. talents. Uh -huh. yeah. As someone who doesn't have those talents, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate them. You'd be surprised. Mm. Yeah, surprised. you never know. Yeah, you don't know. You, you never know until you try. Yeah. So we have a few comments in the chat that I want to um, read and uh, then we'll get on to the last piece. Carolyn says to everyone, I am laughing. Marta, <laughs> you are great. <laughs> Tom says, brava to everyone. Carolyn says that I'm pretty good. <laughs> and a mile of Tom, whose line is that? Well, we went through that already. <laughs> Tom might claim to that. And Lynn is nailing it. Woohoo! Yeah. yeah, wow, exactly. Tom, you two want to go into showbiz. Who is that? <laughs> you two. Oh, no. the, uh, yeah, that was the uh, wedding. The wedding, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Mendor, ladies, you were great. Thank you very much. Great play, great players. Uh, that was from Jane Newhagen, and I think that was the one after ours, which was loaded. I think that's when I saw that message. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, Sandy says, that was a great script and wonderful performances. Mm -hmm. Sandy, can you tell us which uh, script you were talking about? Are you gone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here, but actually, Ann wrote that. So, um, uh, oh, okay. Come in, Sandy. Yeah, yeah. And I really don't remember the time when she actually wrote that. That was probably after the. I can't tell you which. I saw her do it, and I can't tell you when. She's just left the room. So. All right, that's I'm okay. Answer that. And mm -hmm. Mindor said, "Love it." <laughs> So is that just a general comment, Mendor, or did you uh, say oh, it was Rick, It was in reference to Rick and, um, and Jane. Jane. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, loaded. So Carol I, I just White, think the whole, the whole whole concept of, of um, um, you know, success of uh, authors is really fascinating. Um, it's really fun to see what the products are. All of yeah, them. we had a lot of fun doing it, and um, I wanted to do it again, but they were kind of burned out by that. <laughs> it was five scripts. Maybe, you know, maybe like, next year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, we do have one more, and then um, if people are interested, maybe we can read the last one. Uh, Carol had to sign off and uh, uh, go to another event. But she enjoyed the writing and the acting. So uh, I was very pleased to see Carol here at all. Mm -hmm. OK, so if everybody would please turn off their camera and their microphone. And um, Mindor, you can leave your mic on to introduce uh, Hear the Wind Blow. You were doing, you told me you were going to do that since I'm the stage director. Uh, you're absolutely right. All right, Here the Wind Blow was originated by Bill Showman. Jacqueline Lemaitre is played by Cecilia de Kanga, and Sylvia Goldberg is played by Jane Newhagen. 
and stage directions will be read by Mindor Green. A bar in Chicoutimi, a small town in Quebec, French Canada. It's a fall day around five in the afternoon. It's getting dark. In the gloom, we can just make out an old piano. Jacques Lemaitre, the owner, bartender, a portly man, middle-aged or a little older, is behind the bar, getting ready for the night's business, washing the glasses and drying them off. He sings a pop tune to himself as he works. The door is open and Sylvia Goldberg, a stunning Anglophone, red head, elegantly dressed, a bit past her prime, walks in. She and her bartender, she and the bartender regard each other for a moment. She approached the bar. Uh, 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 yes, is this your place? Yes. You know a guy named Joe Ledoux? Finger? Yeah. He plays here some nights. Why? I have some business with him. Oh, yeah? What kind of business? Sylvia fetched her purse a small decorative box like a tiny coffin. She places it on the bar. Jack opened the box and examines its contents. Mon Dieu! Merde! Exact. Joe will be pleased to see his errant digit. He'll be able to play Debussy again. That thing must be 15 years old. My sources say over 20. But how did you come by it? Piano players can be jealous, vengeful, and unforgiving lot. The competition is uh, sharp. As is your wit. But you did not answer my question. It was a bar fight, of course, many moons ago. Must have been a lot at stake. Quite right. Me. <laughs> Joe was performing that night. Il était incroyable, sa musique m'a fait monter à la flèche, soaring. He could see how much I enjoyed his playing. He began to flirt with me shamelessly. And then my husband walked in. I saved it, poor, poor Joe. Always intended to return it. Uh, Mieux vaut tard que jamais. Better late than never. Yes, honorable intentions and all that. My husband passed last month. I thought the time had come. Do you expect him to play anytime soon? Sometimes finger comes in on windy nights. Il vient quand le vent, le vent souffle. I cannot wait for the vent de souffle. To meet him, you must have a phone number, an address. No. After losing his finger, finger became a recluse. No contact information. But tell me, how you think he will react when he sees his old dead finger? Qu'est-ce qu'il va faire avec les doigts morts? Perhaps it can be revived, reattached. There's a clinic in Toronto doing miracles with transplants. Yeah, my sister and his sister 
are friends. I can explore that connection. John nods meaningfully. Then he busies himself, cleaning the counter in the manner of our men from time's beginning. He turns to a small stove behind him, tosses the last ingredient into a large stew pan, stirs the pot, and turns back to Sylvia. When Finger comes in, we'll sit at a table, just we three, Share a bowl of this, a glass or two, and talk over old times. It smells delicious. What is it? Ragout de boulette, our famous French Canadian meatball stew. I also throw in pig's knuckles and whatever other leftovers are lying around. Thinker loves this dish. We'll surprise him with your gift. Speaking of which, where did you put it? I gave it to you, didn't I? No, I thought it was right here on the counter. Jock and Sylvia looked at each other, then turned to look in horror at the student. Ah. Curtain. <laughs> That's hysterical. 